morning we're talking about trusting in the Lord, and, um, you know, which is having faith in God, or having faith in the Lord. We're reading from 1 John chapter 5, and uh, picking up and reading from the first five verses. Hallelujah. If you'll just run over there with us. It is in your Bible. If it's not in your Bible, get rid of that Bible and go to the bookstore. We got one that's a real Bible. All right. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him and that begat loveth also him that is begotten of him. By this we know that, uh, we, this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Uh, or grievous. And let, just understand, whatever God tells you to do is for your good. There are people who fight the word of God or fight the commands of God, fight the instructions of the word of God um, because it's their flesh talking. It's just flat out, bottom line, their flesh wants to do stuff. Okay? God's commands are not grievous. They're not going to be injurious to you. They're not going to hurt you. When God says don't, it's not because he doesn't want you to have fun. It's because it'll kill you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. All right? <clears throat> um, you know, if people listen to God all the time, they'd stay out of a whole lot of trouble. They'd stay out of all the trouble. All right? Hallelujah. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So, now, coming into this, there's a couple things here. Obviously, the Bible teaches us that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith amen and that it is the lifestyle of the believer to live by faith the just shall live by faith amen but we're we were focusing this morning and we're in and with this teaching we're going to talk about trusting the lord we're going to read uh, several scriptures from the old covenant today they're still ap applicable to our lives but um we're focusing on the fact that you know many of us have been taught to use faith Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, something is Hagen 22, 23, and 24. It's, it's Mark, you know, uh, you know, praise God, Dad, Dad's ministry was founded upon, that's what the Lord told him. He, he told Brother Hagen, or Dad Hagen, to go teach my people faith. That was his ministry. Do you understand that somebody has a ministry and obedience to God to go teach something doesn't mean it's the only subject in the Bible. And he would tell you the same thing. And pastor, his son, would tell you the same thing. There's other subjects in the Bible to be taught besides faith. That was his ministry. And even in that, even in his ministry, he taught other things all around that. Uh, love, talked about the gifts of the Spirit, talked about the, the works of the Holy Spirit, talked about prayer, intercession, all kinds of things he, he ministered on. But his primary import of his ministry was to teach people faith. Now, if we're not careful, we, we'll, we'll zero in on that, and that's all we want to hear. But you know, there's other subjects in the Bible. Now, his primary ministry in the lines of faith was the prayer of what we refer to as the prayer of faith, prayer of believing and receiving, uh, is really a better description of it because um, it is, we call it the prayer of faith, but all prayer should be prayed in faith. Amen. Um, but it is the prayer of believing and receiving. In other words, you take God as word, you believe, you receive it, and, and you release your faith in that and speak it. Hallelujah. And that is a, that is a vital and, and an important aspect of the walk of faith. But we're focusing right now uh, just because I believe that many people have gotten so trained in praying the prayer or of faith, the prayer of believing and receiving, that they forgot about that faith also is a trust and a reliance and a confidence in God. Not just using the faith of God, but having faith in God. All right? And honestly, we said this this morning, we'll reiterate tonight, that your ability to use the faith of God is limited or could govern in its effectiveness by your faith in God. In other words, the more you know and trust and rely and have confidence in God, the, the, the more ability you will have to use the faith of God. Okay, so there's, that's an important aspect and an important point. And so now we're not coming here and throwing the baby out of the bat. We're not coming here and throwing out the prayer of faith. That's not what we're here. That's not, that, that's not the intention. That's not the motive. That's not the import of what we're doing. We're simply saying there's an aspect that we need to re refocus on and make sure we're operating in that arena so that we're effective in the prayer of faith. 
Are y'all with us? All right. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and so we, uh, we, we kind of left up. We didn't kindly. We did leave off this morning. Okay, stop shaking your head at me. If you don't put in the right password, uh, the iPad will, will shake at you. you. Stop shaking at me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, we went over, on over. Let's go on to Proverbs chapter 3. We'll pick back up there and then we'll run from there. Proverbs chapter 3. And again, we said this morning that, you know, there are those who want to get rid of the Old Testament because it messes up their narrative. But the bottom line is the Old Testament was given to us as an example. And the wisdom of Proverbs is wisdom for today. If God gave Solomon more wisdom than any man before him or ever will come after him, and he wrote the, 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 the uh, largest portion of the book of Proverbs, then we got a lot of wisdom there we need to tap into. And it was wisdom that, wisdom that God gave him. Hallelujah. Amen? And so it's good for all the ages. So Proverbs chapter 3, we'll start in verse um, 5. Trust in the Lord. Now this word uh, is one of the words translated from the, uh, into the Septuagint by the word pistis. Okay? It's one of the Greek words, one of the Hebrew words that, that pistis is used to transfer, trust here, meaning rely on or have confidence in. So rely on, have your confidence in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Then you can go to the next verse. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Um, so, here, so we have here some wisdom here. And, what, and part of that wisdom is trust or put your reliance and your confidence in God. How? With all your heart. And then lean not to your own understanding. Now, let me say that there's a lot of stuff. Uh, we said this last week. I've heard, I've heard ministers sit around on programs and talk and say, well, I asked the Lord what this word meant. He told me da-da-da-da-da-da. And you go look in, the, you go look in concordances and, 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 and uh, uh, lexicons and all kind of things, and you can't find it, that anywhere. You can't study it uh, um, in, in context and get that out of it. But the Lord, well, well the, in their own experience of life, maybe, that did, that, maybe that's how the Lord ministered to them, and it, it meant that to them in, in that context of their experience of life, and, and they, they understood it within the parameters of what it meant in the Word and so forth. But you can't go teach that. Because you, you don't have the same parameters of life that they have from, you're not coming from the same place they're coming from. Right. The Lord might speak to you about things, and it makes sense within your understanding of the word and, and how he's talked to you and, and, and within the context of, of your view, but you go give it to somebody else and it's totally something different. Right. Amen. Let, let's take somebody. Um, let's go to a foreign country. And, they, and somebody's learning English, strict English. And, and, and you come up to somebody and you go, dude, I am bad. Which you mean here, you're really awesome. They're, they're going, bad, that's bad, you're bad, you're bad. <laughs> you know, and they're backing away because their context and understanding of the language is, that's bad, you're bad, bad means bad. Mal, mali. I mean, you start going to all these different countries and you say bad and all that, they're, they're thinking their word bad and it's not good, okay? So, I said that to say this, let's make sure we stay within, within the parameters of, of good Bible interpretation and not, and not you know, uh, sharing things that, that the Lord showed us for us that, that won't teach other people to live certain, certain ways. Let's stay with the word. Amen? All right, now, so lean not to your own understanding. People come along and say, well, I think this means, I mean, I've had people tell me, you know, I hear them say it sometimes, you know, the Lord showed me this and the Lord showed me that. And you're, you're kind of, uh, well, it doesn't line up with the Bible. Now, how can the Lord show you what doesn't line up with the Bible? Now, let's, let's, let's just jump on this one. I, um, uh, one of the, the big hot uh, topics in the church today is can we drink wine or not? You know, that's, just a, that's a major issue. People just want, I can drink wine, the Lord showed me that. that. You know, Jesus turned the water into wine. Oh, really? Now, if you go study your Bible, and you, well, not just your Bible, but you study the words and study the languages and go back in history, the word wine could mean fermented or unfermented. It did not mean fermented drink. It could be used either way. That, that Greek word was used either way. Now, let me ask you a question. Because if Jesus turned the water into fermented wine, he violated his own word. 
What do you mean? Well, the Bible has a whole lot to say about drunkenness and the folly of drunkenness and, you know, and, and overindulging and on and on and on and on. And the Bible says they had well drunk. If he turned it into fermented wine, he contributed to the further intoxication of them. Good you on that one for a while. Would he violate his own word? You know he wouldn't. Say the best for last. Well, you know, it was good grape juice. Yeah, the, the Biltmore stuff. Now, you know, listen, we, we go to the Biltmore and, you know, they, they, they have a winery, but they also, you know, they sell red Concord grape juice and, and a white Catawba grape juice. Best grape juice you'll ever get. I just, makes well just taste like, you know, one of them little syrupy drinks you get from, you know, with extra sugar in it or something. It's awesome. But I don't buy the alcoholic stuff, you know. Now, we'll, you know, we'll buy the sparkling, which is the, the carbonate, we put carbonation in it. I don't, I don't buy the infirmary, but the, both of those are good. They're all good, you know. They say they got good wines. I got, I love, they got good unfermented wine. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, I, me and, and the problem is if it opens up and gets in our refrigerator, me and Nathan fight over who gets it. <laughs> Everybody pour the little glass of it. You don't have just, in this drink it moderation. We <laughs> bring it on, baby. Hallelujah. So, so, you know, don't lend your understanding. He said, well, Jesus turned to water and wine. Do some study. How could he make it fermented wine if his word forbids drunkenness and they're already well drunk and he's going to give them more fermented wine to get them drunk or drunker? Couldn't do it. It would violate the word. See, see, if you study your Bible, you start thinking about these things instead of looking for an out. Everybody, everybody's on looking for the, the little things so they can make their point instead of studying out and studying the whole in the context and getting revelation. So lean, don't lean to your own understanding. Put your trust in God. And here, let me say this. If you're putting your trust in God and God tells you don't do something, know this, it's always for your good. And God tells you to do something, it's for your good. Obey my commandments. That's for your good. Don't fornicate. That's for your good. <coughs> Hello? That one ever big. All right. So in all your ways, you said this this morning, all your ways acknowledge him means to consider or bring him into, you know, in other words, consider him, bring him into, really bring him into the discussion of your thought life. Do, do, are my ways, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm walking in this way. Now I'm going to consider you. Does that please you? Does that honor you? Does that... Does that work with you, basically? And he says, and he should direct your path. In other words, when you put him into consideration, he'll lead, begin to lead and guide you. Amen? They that are led by the Spirit of the God are the sons of God. If people would spend more time being led by the Spirit instead of trying to figure out how to do what they want to do, they'd be better off. Instead of looking for a message or something that, you know, somebody preached and somebody taught and, and some part of the Bible that somebody left out and, you know, some paraphrase, they put scriptures together. They gave them the, the, the liberty to do what they want to do in their flesh. Why? Let me ask you something. Why would you want to obey your flesh? Now, remember here, uh, go with me. I don't know where it is. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh we have no trust we have no reliance we put no we 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 give no credence to the dictates of can you find that scripture belinda thank you Philipp, philippians 3 3 we are the circumcision which worship god in the spirit and rejoice in christ jesus and have no confidence in the flesh but what does the bible tell us to do have our trust and our confidence and reliance on god or in god why because your flesh is flaky I said, your flesh is flaky. Now, let me tell you how flaky flesh can be. I just read this <laughs> just this morning, I think. <clears throat> there were two couples in Texas that wanted to get married, and the question is, it was for Texas first gay, legal gay marriage? Question mark. We read the article. The two of the people, so there's two couples, and one of each of the couples were by chromosome male who had gender reassignment surgery. So in their thinking, they're women, but according to the law, they're men. So, they had gender reassignment surgery to become a woman so they could marry a woman. 
Your flesh is flaky. Flesh can be messed up. Are you, <laughs> I know Jerry's going, what? That's what I was, what? It just makes no sense. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Anyway, that's how flesh, your flesh could just be flat out flaky. So we don't put any confidence in our flesh. Why? Because your flesh will not guide and lead you right. It will not lead you in the right paths. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Amen. So your, your flesh is not a what? It's not a good guide. Amen. As a matter of fact, it is to be brought into subjection. Paul wrote and said to the church, he said, you know, the, to offer your body a living sacrifice, which is acceptable to God. You've got to keep it on the altar. You've got, to keep that, you've got to keep that flesh down. In other words, the dictates and the appetites of the flesh. You can't, necessarily, you can't literally nail your flesh to the cross, but you can symbolically in your thinking keep it on the cross, in other words, in subjection to the lordship of Jesus Christ and of the recreated human spirit who is following after God. Yeah. Yeah. He who sows to the spirit shall love the spirit reap life everlasting. Amen? Amen? So present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and stuff. So you've got to keep your body on, on, on the sacrificial plane of life. So, you, so we, what is this? We put no confidence in our flesh. That is a scriptural principle of the new covenant. See, we've got people trying to teach people that you can go ahead and do anything with your flesh because it doesn't matter. And the Bible says don't put your confidence in it and keep it as a sacrifice. Why? Because we're to be led by the Spirit. Well, how are you going to be led by the Spirit? You're going to have to keep your trust and reliance and confidence in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your understanding. And yeah. all your ways, consider Him, and He'll direct your paths. Then we said this morning, Psalm 23 says, that He'll lead you in, paths of, of, in pastures, of, in green pastures. He'll lead you by the cool waters. <clears throat> and even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you won't have to be afraid because He's with you. Amen? So you understand, it's important that we as believers put our trust in the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 29, 25 says, the, I mean, Proverbs, I'm sorry, Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso put his trust, his confidence, his reliance in the Lord shall be safe. Thank God. We've we got we to stop, you know, we've just got to get to where we're, we're spending time with the Lord and we're trusting. We're, you know, listen, remember we read this morning that the word pistis does not mean a, um, a, a passive faith or, or a resignation to what's going on in life. And like, like and, and, you know, just, you know, it's fate, it's just going to be what it is. That's not what it means. It does not mean a passive resignation to life. In other words, well, fate determines that whatever's going to happen, whatever will be, will be. That's not what it means. You're, you're, you're trusting. You know your God. And you know your God will keep his promise. You know your God will do what he said he would do. You know your God is there with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. When you have your trust in him, when you rely on him, when you have your confidence in him, praise God. Amen. You're not trusting in your flesh. Why? Because we're the circumcision. We worship, right in Christ, we worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. I don't put any confidence in my flesh. I put my confidence in the one who has redeemed me, glory to God. The one who is, the, who is and was and is and is to come. The one who has reigned forever, glory to God. I don't put any confidence in my flesh. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 73, 28 says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Well, that's a heavy revy, isn't it? It is good, but it is good. You have the Psalm 73, 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I've put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. It's good to get near to God. Brethren, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Let's just first over first John. Hallelujah. Let 
Finding that? Yeah, if I hearken to it. First John 3. There, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You back up just a little bit. Verse 18 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us not, God is greater than, all, uh, than our heart and knoweth all things. If, beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, it says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. And he that keepeth his commandment, no, words, so he said this is his commandment. It wasn't the only, it was one of them, but it wasn't the only one. He said, keeps his commandments. Now, look there, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. So what does this tell me? It's back over in Proverbs 73. It's good for us to draw near to God. Amen. And then we said, well, <clears throat> when we look at Psalm 73, it says, it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust, my confidence in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Now, if your heart's condemning you, guess what? You can't have confidence toward God. So you got to get that cover. You got to get that out of the way. So you can draw near to him. See, I'm telling you, there's teachings in the church today that are put on by people who are greedy for filthy lucre. That's all I know to say. And the purpose of it is so they can gain, they, they can gain wealth, but the Satan's motive in motivating them to do this is to have people who don't have pure hearts before God. In other words, their heart will condemn them. They're trying to teach themselves not to be condemned. Right. Because they're under something. I'm, well, I'm not condemned. I'm under grace. And yet, the Bible's teaching us that if your heart condemns you not, then you have confidence toward God. You see, it's a good thing to draw near to God. But it's hard to draw near to God when your heart condemns you. Well, what do you do? You go over and do what Hebrews says. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need, that we may find mercy and grace to help. Amen? We apply First John 1 night. I don't care what anybody says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ's son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So what happens? We, when we get cleansed by the blood, then there's no condemnation in our heart. When there's no condemnation in our heart, we can have confidence in God. And we have confidence in God. We can draw near to God, have confidence in God, and it's a good thing. Satan doesn't want you close to God. Did you know that? Satan doesn't want you in an intimate relationship with the Father or the Son or the Holy Ghost. Satan wants you to think that, you know, you're, you know, he wants you to put confidence in your flesh that it's okay to do whatever you're doing with your flesh because it just don't matter. He wants that. Why? Because it's a separator. It'll separate you out when the Bible's teaching us. Why? Because he doesn't want you using, you learn how to use your faith. He doesn't want you to have an intimate relationship with the Father and be in confidence and trust and reliance on Him so that then because you know Him and walk with Him and fellowship with Him and are in that place with Him, then you can use your faith to get things in. He doesn't want that. He wants you dumb. Hello? It's the same spirit working in, the, in, in, in our world today. Dumb them down in the school system so they don't know right from wrong and don't know left from right, don't even know how to add two plus two. And then somebody come along and say, I'm going to give you the world. They go, okay. I, I love what Margaret Thatcher said one time. She said, socialism works until you run out of other people's money. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Living in the flesh works until, uh, until it catches up with you. You know, so, you know, wages of sin is death. That doesn't mean, listen. Sometimes the Bible refers to death. It doesn't mean it's going to kill you and don't dead on the spot. Because if that would happen, Adam and Eve would have been dead in the garden. But the consequences long term are going to be destruction of the kingdom of death. There'll be destruction. There'll be misery. There'll be lack of peace. There'll be, there'll, there'll be turmoil. There'll be things that don't go right. There'll be, there'll be trouble on the left and on the right. They'll, you know, on one, one scripture tells us that you know, he abides in the shadow of the Almighty and says, you know, uh, you know a thousand fall by one hand and ten thousand by the other and won't come nigh your dwelling. Well, see, if you're not abiding, they all, they'll all show up at your front door and knock on it and come in. Now, put your, keep your trust in God. It's a good thing to draw near to God. Now, here's the thing about drawing near to God. 
when you draw near to him, think. go to Colossians chapter 3. That's right after Philippians. We'll just read chapter 3, 1 and 2, at least. If ye then be risen with Christ. How many are risen with Christ? Amen. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections, or affection, on things above and not on things of the earth. When you begin to draw near to God, He's going to begin to deal with you about earthly things. Now, as we said before, there are things that are sinful. I'm not preaching on sin. I'm telling you, when you put your trust in God and you put your reliance and confidence in God and you begin to draw near to Him and get close to Him, things of this world, we're, we want our affections on the heavenly things. Now, on the other side of that, <clears throat> you don't want to get so, quote, heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. In other words, you get weird. I don't have a body. Yes, you do have a body. I mean, just, you know, people get weird, you know. We don't have to get weird, okay? That's, that's where Christian science and, and Gnosticism came out of. You know, your body's not even real. This isn't even a real. Well, why are you here? I'll show you how real it is. Pop! Do you feel that? It's real. <coughs> oh, well. Set your affection on things above. See, when you begin to draw close to God, I mean, he said it's a good thing for me to draw near to God. Then all of a sudden, as you get closer to him, he begins to deal with you. Not, he will deal with you about sin, but he also will deal with you about weight or carnality. Yeah. Things that are just fleshly that may not be, quote, you can't find the scripture that says it's sin, but it's carnal. And you're sowing to it. In other words, you're giving it more preeminence in your life than God. Hello? And he's dealing with you about it as you draw near to him. Set yourself aside unto him. And he's dealing with you about that. Now, there are a lot of people who don't want to deal with that because it's okay for them to do it. In other words, they want to sow to their flesh. And my question to you really is why? Where is your flesh going to lead you? Where's your flesh going to take you? What reward will your flesh give you? I mean, the Bible even says sin has ple there's pleasure in sin for a season. But then, honey, comes payday, and I ain't talking about the candy bar. I like the candy bar. Amen? So it's for your dead, listen to this, for your dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our, li who is our life, Anybody remember what it's like for Jesus to be the center of your life? Everything revolved around the Lord. Now we fit the Lord in somewhere. Uh, well, you fit in here, Lord. Here's your tin. Here, here's, here's, here's your slot. So on my graph on my paper, you're outlined in blue on my time chart, daily time chart. That's not his, that, he needs to be your life. Amen. Shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore. I'm sorry, had to keep going. Your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, uh, <laughs> duh, evil, uh, let's see here, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sate the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which time you walk some. Uh, you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you're to put also, you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie. Now listen. Well, you know, certain words are only cuss words because we deem them cuss words. So it's okay for me to say them. The Bible says filthy communication shouldn't be coming out of your mouth. It's just Bible. Amen. Thank you. Lie not one to another. See that you have put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, we'll just stop there because I was really after setting your affections. But then, you know, notice how he says when you do this, now you're going to have to put off these things. We want to put off these things. We want to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Everybody say mortify the deeds of the flesh. 
Your flesh should not be dictating to you. Listen, it's going to hurt your faith if it does. And so what do we do? We come back to pursuing after God. You know, as the deer panteth after the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Amen? You know what it says? We used to sing that. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Remember that? Some of you, I, I, my voice is not going up there on a good day. And today's not a good day as far as uh, hitting that note. Amen? Isn't that right? See, but God tells us in, in Jeremiah, he says, Call unto me and I will answer thee. In other words, the heart of man should pursue God. Amen. Amen. Stop. I'm telling you, people watching on, 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 around the world, stop trying to find a way to let your flesh have preeminence in your life. Mortify its deeds and pursue after God. Come into a trust and a reliance and a confidence in your Father and in the Son and in the Holy Ghost and put your confidence there. In other words, put your faith in God. The reason I'm using these other words because people have so, so uh, limited the definition that when you say put your faith in God, they're thinking, I can believe I receive. Well, that's part, that, that is the outgrowth. Using the faith of God is an outgrowth of having faith in God. Does that make sense? It, it's birthed out of having faith in God. And so, God, this proverb says, uh, to draw near to God's a good thing. For me to draw near to God's a good thing. Wow. Could have drawn near to God, said it had in the V8. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Psalm 37 3 says, Trust in the Lord. Again, put your confidence, reliance in the Lord and do good. And so shalt thou dwell in the land and verify thee, and, ver and verily, and verily thou shalt be fed. Psalm 37, 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust or put your confidence, reliance also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The seventh verse. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him that prospers in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wickedness, wicked devices to pass. In other words, rest in him. See, I'm telling you, when you get to know God, you can begin to rest in God. Oh, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Then you can go rest. Isn't it good to rest? I think resting is a good thing. Being uptight all the time is not a good thing. Amen? Hallelujah. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge unto, for us. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So what? Put your confidence, your trust in him when? at all times. Pour your heart out before him. Amen. I'm telling you, as you come into that place of intimacy with God in your confident reliance and trust in him, Man, that just make everything. It, make, it makes, makes faith a whole lot easier. The way, the way we talk about faith. Using it to, to believe and receive and to get answers and receive the Bible. And, you know. It's a whole lot easier to, to operate in the, the dictates of, of the author when you know the author. Yeah. And know where he was coming from. Amen. And that's really what we're talking about here. See, that, that trust and reliance and confidence comes from drawing near to him, getting the stuff out of the way that's in hindrance, not looking for ways that we can do the things that are hindrances, and excusing it is okay. Okay? You might go to heaven, and in some cases quicker than the rest of us. Because if you think smoking dope and drinking and all that's okay, you're going to be out in your car one day, drive around like a fool. You can get yourself in a wreck. You kill somebody and yourself. Well, I made heaven. Yeah, but you took five people out who went to hell. That went over big. 
The song is not all about me. It's all about him. Amen. And so we come, we're coming back to a place. We've got to come back to the place in the church. And, and honestly, the whole church won't, will not be coming back. There's a separation taking place in the kingdom of God. From those who are serious about following after God, have a heart for the, the true things of God, and those who want to play games. And, and listen, remember, how many remember when the Soviet Union existed? Now, up, up until the time, you know, when the czars were there, the Russian Orthodox Church, or the Eastern Orthodox, which the Russian Orthodox is part of the Eastern Orthodox whole, whole thing. And the Orthodox churches were the churches that separated from the church at Rome and didn't, did not accept the, the supreme authority of the papacy, the Pope. Okay? They didn't accept it, and so you separate, the church is separated. And you had the church at Rome, which had a pope, and then you had the Eastern, the Eastern churches, which were, I believe, originally um, um, headquartered in Constantinople, which today is Istanbul. Okay? And, um, and so the Eastern churches were very Catholic in operation, but they, didn't, they did not accept the authority of a single papal figure. Okay? And so... Uh, when the Soviet Union took over, when, when they had the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and communism took over, and, and, they, and, and they, even had, they still allowed the, the Orthodox churches to operate, but they became political agents of the, of the government. The, the KGB would go to the services and they would spy on the people and all that kind of stuff. All the religious art was taken out of the buildings, put down in the basements where people couldn't see any of it. Because, of the, you know, the, the, a lot of the times, a lot of the art was what preached the gospel because people couldn't read. So it was done with art. A lot of the stories were told, if you go in a lot of churches with stained glass windows, a lot of the stories were told with the stained glass windows because people could, were, were illiterate in a lot of cases and couldn't read. And then, of course, with the church at Rome, put the, put the thing in a language they couldn't read in the first place and then preach in a language they couldn't understand. People didn't understand Latin. So they were preaching in Latin, translating in Latin, and so they used stained glass windows to preach. Because people didn't get anything else. All right? <clears throat> but so they, they, you go into some churches, you'll see the whole, you'll see the, 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 the message of the gospel, the fall of man, the redemption of man, and everything, on stained glass in pictures. Okay. So they took a lot of that art out and hid it so that people wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't get the gospel. All right. All, during all, all through communism. You can't keep God out. When, last time that I was in Estonia, or time before last, uh, I was in Estonia. Um, there, were, there were some people there. They ran a radio station in, in, there in Tallinn. And we had gone, we had, um, I was meeting, was, I was preaching, and then we came back and met up with those guys. And uh, Alan had been with, Alan and I think Benny had been with this guy from the radio station. So they started telling me the story. He was telling them how that there was, back in the 70s, there was a major healing revival at the Church of the Holy Spirit there in Tallinn. There's a church in Tallinn, big, it's got a big, tall spire around it, and it's named the Church of the Holy Spirit. And back in the 70s, they had a major healing revival there. And people from all over Russia or the Soviet Union were getting papers to come to Tallinn because you, you could only travel by papers in, in that, in, then in the Soviet Union. If you wanted to go from Moscow to Tallinn, you had to have papers and permission just to travel within your own country. And that's what people are trying to bring here. Don't, don't think there's not. That's what they're trying to bring here. Some of the stuff going on, with, with you just need to stay in faith. <laughs> But anyway, they had stretchers, they had crutches, they had beds, they had all kinds of things piled up in the basement from all the people that were getting healed. And then prayer calls were being sent out all over the, all over the Soviet Union from there. People getting healed. There was a, there was, you can't keep God out. You think, you think your iron curtain, and the bamboo curtain's coming. Everybody thinks that China's going to do this. God's going to get, Brother Hagin prophesied in 2003, or right before 2003, he said, he said that uh, God had his way with the iron curtain, he's going to have his way with the bamboo curtain. Amen. Hallelujah. So don't be, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Amen. Peace I give you, not as the world gives, Hallelujah. Glory to God. The church is coming into our finest hour. But that being said, there's part of the church that's going to go the way of the flesh and never come back. They're, they're just going to follow after that. So we, we want to be part of the church that stays after the spirit, stays after the ways of God and the things of God. Amen. Hallelujah. We're, 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 we're after pleasing and honoring God. And we've got to get the people with the true gospel, the full counsel of God's word. Amen. Don't be surprised. 
when God raises up non-charismatic ministries to reach people for the kingdom and they're having great success because their heart's right for God. And don't be surprised you find out later they were closet charismatics. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. They were praying in tongues in their closet. Just didn't tell anybody because they get kicked out. But they knew there was power there. Hallelujah. Amen. Trust in him all times. Pour out your heart. Now, Psalm 115, 9-11. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is, the, he is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Three times they're commanded to put your confidence and your reliance into God. And your dependence on God. Amen. Oh, glory to God. See, this, this is faith in God. Hallelujah. When you put your faith in God, you can absolutely use the faith of God. Now remember Jesus. Now, now remember this? Remember this statement he made? When the centurion came to him and said, speak the word only, he turned and said, I've not found so great a faith, no, not in all of Israel. And he marveled. He mar he marveled. You, you, you'll, you'll find two places Jesus marveled. At the unbelief of the Jews and at the faith of the unbelievers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Remember the Syrophoenician woman? Master, my daughter, the grievous is vexed with the devil, come and heal her. He says, it's not me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. She said, yeah, Lord, but just the crumbs will fall from the master's table. That's all I need. I just need a little crumb. And he marveled because of her great faith. Yeah. And then when, when Israel wouldn't receive, he marveled because of their unbelief. Why did he marvel because of their unbelief? Because they had all this teaching. They had all the old covenant. They had all the things that should have pointed them to having faith in God and a reliance on God and a trust in God and knowing God. They should have been able just to just exercise the faith of God. They've become so carnal and so religious about their faith, trust in God that they were really trusting in some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They were trusting their chariots and horses. They were trusting in their flesh. They were trusting in their sacrifices. They were trusting in everything except they weren't trusting in God. Why? Because you can't, ever, you can't give your flesh an inch. Now, we said earlier as we were teaching in the beginning of the, of, of the year on the um, Egypt just ain't all that. Remember that? We we're teaching on that. How that <clears throat> Israel, even, even when God was doing the miracles, they would get upset with Moses because they didn't get, get let go yet. After 10 major miracles, things had never been seen before, they all get set free, rich. Hello? Come up to the Red Sea. You know, they fuss about that. God splits it and stands it up, congeals it, freezes it. They walk over on dry ground. God drowns the whole Egyptian army in, uh, in the depths of the sea. Miriam has a, has a Holy Ghost shout and dance. Go a few days later, Moses goes up the mountains up there 30, 40 days, and all of a sudden they're building calves to go back. You can't give your flesh an inch. You know why? It'll take 12 and think it's a ruler. Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay. That's a good for a Friday, yeah. bad Friday joke. <laughs> it'll, show, it'll show up sometime soon. Hallelujah. No, your, fle your flesh is, it dictates, its appetites are carnal. Do you know that? You know that. That's why you're to offer your body a living sacrifice. That's why you're to buffet your body. That's why you're to keep it under. So that you can follow after your spirit and draw close to God with your spirit. You're just going to tell your flesh no. In, oh, remember I said the other day how that if you tell your flesh no and you're trusting in God and you're walking with God, you know, the Holy Ghost gives power to your no. The greater one in you. But you got to say no for him to get power to the door. Amen. You know, I mean, people who do all, all the kinds of things people have done on the earth, Christians who've, who've gotten caught up in adultery and, and things like that, if all they had to do was say no and walk away. All they do is run out of the house like David, yeah. even if she was tearing your clothes off while you're running out the door. Did I say David? Joseph, thank you. David gave in. Said, Bathsheba, baby, come on over. 
You're the next contestant on Is the King for a Night. All right. It's amazing how stuff come, kind of comes out, doesn't it? Said so the price is right, the king for the night. And then that whole thing messed up. No. Joseph ran out of Potiphar's house. She was stripping his clothes off of him as he was running out. Because he said no. You got to say no to your flesh and yes to God. Amen. All right. Psalm 146, uh, let's see, Psalm 125. One day that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Psalm 146, 3 through 5. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. And it's talking about men. Not referring to the Old Testament reference to Jesus as the Son of Man. His breath goes forth. He, remaineth to his, uh, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, and whose hope is in the Lord his God. Proverbs 22, 19. That thy tr we need to look over there because I don't have all the scripture there. So, uh, Proverbs 22. Starting around verse 17. Bow thou in thy ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. The, what, his words. They shall, be with all, they shall with all be fitted in thy lips. If you keep the words in you, they'll come out of your mouth. Okay? That, listen, they'll be fitted in your lips that they, thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Amen? So he says here that take the words, apply them to your heart. It's a pleasant thing. They'll come out of your mouth, and when they come out of your mouth, that'll bring trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, Isaiah 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust thee and be not afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Jehovah is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Oh, I'm sorry. David Engel's song with Buddy Harris is singing and, you know, those guys all get together on some thing. Anyway, it was good. Jeremiah 17, let's, let's stop here. Eight and, seven and eight. Blessed is the man that puts his confidence, reliance, and trust in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spread out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of the drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Wow. Why? Wow. Because your trust is in God. I said your trust is in God. When we say, I will put my trust in God. I'm going to put my faith in my God. I'm not going to use the faith of I'm not talking about using the faith of God. We're putting our confidence and our reliance and our trust in God. We know God. Then when I need to use the faith of God, how hard is that? When I begin to say, my God shall deliver me. My faith's already in God. And then I can say and use the faith of God and say, you know, my God shall deliver me with a strong arm because I know him. I'm in covenant with him. I'm in relation with him. I'm in, you know, reliance upon him. Then I start looking at his word, what he said, and I know him. He's not a man that he should lie. Amen. Nor the son of man that he should repent. Glory to God. Hallelujah.